generosity and for your time. Thank you. Um, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thanos, for your kind words. Uh, uh, Thanos has been very kind with the introduction. Um, let me uh, take a minute or two to just lay out what Fair Observer is, because it's not such a well-known name for some of you. Uh, Fair Observer is, um, you could say, a digital media platform. If you want it to be trendy, if you want it to be old-fashioned, you could say it's a world newspaper. Um, if you want it to be more technical, you could say it is uh, uh, an old-fashioned journal. But what it really uh, does uh, is it uh, creates this community of people from around the world, from more than 2003, uh, from, sorry, from more than 80 countries, um, over 2,300 of them who publish um, who bring you perspectives uh, from uh, different um, points of view. Um, we uh, bridge cultural divides. Um, you will read an Indonesian Islamist and uh, a Greek communist um, on the British election, which if you go to fairobserver.com, I highly encourage you, you will find a 360 degree series on, uh, on, um, on the subject. And what does it mean? It means that you will get one piece that lays out the context, which is, okay, what is the backstory? And why is this issue important or significant, however you want to term it? And various points of view from liberals, from conservatives, from labor. So the idea is that I may not agree with everything Nancy says or Thanos says, but we should be able to hear each other out in a fact-based, well-reasoned manner. So we publish anyone and everyone who is fact-based and well-reasoned after a rigorous editorial process. So we are a crowdsourced, high-quality journal. We are crowdfunded. We have lots of monthly donors. One of them is sitting next to me. Nancy, thank you. And, uh, and that is how we continue to be independent. We think we are the most independent and the most global of all news outlets in the world. I know that is a tall claim, but uh, given the composition of our team, my chairman is ex State Department, Gary Grappel, uh, managing editor Abul Hassan at Siddiq, deputy managing editor Anna Pivovarchuk, um, who speaks and reads Russian, German, and English, and so on and so forth. Very so without very demanding, people. very demanding people, as Thanos will tell you, uh, <laughs> what can you expect from Russians? <laughs> 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 they have a tradition of Tolstoy and Pushkin and Dostoevsky, my friend. So, so much so for 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 Fair Observer, and what Fair Observer is trying to do is democratize global discourse. For too long, global discourse has been dominated by self-anointed elites. And these self-anointed elites often send a foreign correspondent over, particularly if it is Kenya or India. And that person often lives in um, fancy clubs and five-star hotels, and then waxes lyrical about a country where the person doesn't know the language or understand the culture. And we say, hang on a minute, we do need outsiders to write, especially those who have skin in the game, but we also need insiders from all different parts of the world. And, and that is what we are trying to do, which brings me very neatly on to a fundamental issue we are all facing, the global crisis in democracy. There is a threat today which is global, and we need to just look at the map and look at Philippines with Duterte, we move a bit to, to the east, and you get India and Pakistan, and you have two populists. Arguably, you could say they are democratic, maybe they are in some ways, uh, but uh, things are a bit wobbly in, in both countries. You have Imran Khan and, and, and Narendra Modi. Uh, in some ways, of course, democratic, uh, but in some ways, um, you have to, if you want to understand what democracy is, if it is about 
more than rule of the majority, then maybe things are not so great. And we move further um, east. You get to places like Turkey with Erdogan. You get to Egypt. Um, you go a bit uh, in between those countries to Israel, which has been a rambunctious democracy. And even that has seen its institutional fabric frayed. You start moving further west. Um, and, uh, and then you get to Europe, and you get to places like Poland and Hungary. Yeah, to a lesser degree, yes, sir. Um, uh, not as bad as Hungary, of course. Um, uh, that would take the cake. Uh, and you come to the United Kingdom, where, Kingdom, where Boris Johnson and Dominic, Dumming, uh, Dominic Cummings, and I've just written an article on this subject, which I encourage you to read, which has a lot of insider information, by the way, uh, because uh, if you have debated at Oxford, uh, which I did, you have a lot of friends who tell you gossip. Uh, uh, and, uh, and once five of them repeat the same thing, you know that must be <laughs> largely true. <laughs> uh, but it also, it also has a lot of hyperlinked sources. It's not gossip at all, actually, but it has a lot of information I wouldn't know where to go and find if I didn't know people in politics. And there you have this curious phenomenon of, of um, uh, a democracy uh, wherein the country will vote in a prime minister who was voted down by parliament 12 times and, and given a hard rap on his knuckles by the Supreme Court and in, in an 11 nil verdict. And he's about to come back to power. And we move further west and you come to this country, New York. And New York has a New Yorker in the White House a real estate guy called Donald Trump. And I don't need to belabor the point that democracy might not be, might not be in the rudest of healths here. And if you think uh, things are bad in the US, you just have to go south to Brazil, where the Amazon is on fire. And, and you think, hmm, maybe the US is not so bad. <laughs> Bolsonaro makes Trump looks, look good sometimes, actually quite a few times. So what is it that is? driving this forest fire from Philippines to Brazil. Any ideas? Any suggestions? Anyone? Anyone wants to take a crack? Well, since none of you are willing to take a crack, what I will do is I'll rifle through this in about 15 minutes, five minutes each on three themes I have picked up. And then I'm going to take questions for the other 15 minutes because I have half an hour and I want to make it an interactive session. I don't want to be an oracle who speaks and disappears like the Indian gurus, uh, modern Indian gurus. The ancient ones were better at, about this. Um, the first, and I'll draw upon a talk I gave in 2016 at Google on the global rise of the, of the far right. Uh, in 2016, I gave that talk and some of the things I mentioned um, then uh, apply now. The first thing um, and the first point is that the dominant elites and current institutions over the last um, two decades since the fall of the Soviet Union, 1991, have failed a large part of the people. And, and this failure was, was disguised quite, or quite well initially in the promise of a better tomorrow um, through debt in this country uh, and so on and so forth, but now um, cannot be hidden anymore. So point one is a failure of dominant elites and current institutions. Sorry. Current, uh, yeah, exactly. Second point, and this is um, a very important point, is that a fraying of the bonds that knit society together, and those bonds are 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 multidimensional. They are cultural. They are uh, economic. They are social. And we'll go into each of these three strands uh, very briefly. And the third issue, 
and this is an extremely important issue, um, is this extraordinary um, sense of crisis of identity. In a way, uh, technology has moved too fast. In a way, the changes um, in, in, in uh, the environment around us have been almost like a tsunami overwhelming the senses. And, and people's minds are in Brownian motion. And ipso facto, they are looking for an anchor. They are looking for a savior. And all of this, uh, uh, this um, causes democracy to weaken. So let us start with point one. Anyone remembers what was point one? Exactly, good, you're making notes. So the, the dominant, uh, the dominant um, elites and current institutions, I have some water for my throat, sorry, if that's okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, thank you, sir. So what do I mean by dominant elites and current institutions? Now, it is extremely important to remember that um, since 1991, there have been some winners and some losers. Uh, a lot of people have won, but um, thank you. The working class neighborhoods in Ohio or the northern towns of England or many of um, the French industrial cities or Italian industrial cities have seen jobs hemorrhaging out. So because 1991 was such a watershed moment in the global economy, what happened was that the old god of communism died. And now everyone embraced the market. So when everyone embraces the market, what do you have? Well, suddenly the labor supply expands. You've got a billion Indians who are willing to make calls and do outsourcing. Uh, China, by, by the way, had already joined the um, global economy back in 1978, uh, and certainly by 1980. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in 1992, Deng Xiaoping went on his southern tour, and I will mispronounce it. Someone who knows Mandarin can correct me. Uh, Nanshun, he went on this southern tour. And, and basically, he said, and this is three years after Tiananmen, and he says, we've got to open up. We've got to go full steam ahead. And so now you have a huge influx of Chinese labor. So outsourcing starts going to places like India. Manufacturing now starts going to China because the labor is cheap. And, and the people who benefit enormously are people who are owners of capital. And, and of course, the labor in China, that benefits, especially the organized labor, because suddenly now there are jobs in a country that was until very recently, a peasant economy. But so there are losers too, the working class neighborhoods in Europe and the US suffer. Jobs leave. Communities are ripped apart. And for a while, this is hidden. For a while, this is hidden because um, in the 1990s, you have this exuberance, property prices are going up, so people can you know, uh, take a second mortgage out and still enjoy good quality of living. In, and goods, the prices of goods are dropping in, services are dropping because of all this influx of labor supply. So you may, your wages may not be rising, but then you can buy cheap stuff in Walmart so you don't feel that poor. But at some point, this is not exactly sustainable. And, 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 and this sense of crisis wherein in this economy, you suddenly have a reduction of controls on owners of capital. Um, classic example, Glass-Steagall, which Franklin Delano Roosevelt brought in to, to prohibit Wall Street from playing footsie with the savings of um, ordinary citizens. That division between investment banking and commercial banking, which uh, a certain senator, his name will come to me, um, a uh, certain sen senator from uh, North Dakota warned against, warned against uh, ending. He said, you'll have a major crisis. That has moved away. You have the Graham 
Leach, uh, Bleach Lily, uh, sorry, Graham Leach Bliley Act, which repeals Glass Steagall, a Republican Congress, in uh, tandem with Democrat Bill Clinton, allows Wall Street to do whatever they want. And by 2007, you are um, almost um, in a similar crisis to 1929. So, and so what I'm saying very simply is that economically, what happened is that uh, the current institutions failed to keep up with the economic changes. They were unable to build good schools uh, for the people. Uh, public uh, infrastructure declined, particularly in the US. Um, public infrastructure declined even in India. Yes, we had a lot of economic growth and there was a lot of consumerism, but in Ingl India now, uh, India is uh, the best democracy money can buy. Everything is for sale. Kidneys are for sale. If you don't have um, a government job, you'll die, go to a private hospital. And if you don't have money, you'll die. Private hospitals just won't treat you if you don't have money. Government schools, the government teacher goes and takes their salary, but doesn't go to a government school to teach. So even those who live in the slums send their children to a private school. So the interesting thing is government and the problem is not as simple as socialism versus capitalism. That is very reductive and simplistic thinking. Because in India, the government is terrible. Because what the government really does, and it's not just India, Kenya is the same. I used to think when I was in India, it was just India. All former colonies are the same because they've inherited a colonial bureaucracy that is unaccountable. And so what happens is that uh, you work for a government school, you take your salary in a third world former colony, and, 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 um, and uh, the people in the slum send their children to a private school. So there has been a complete collapse of public services by the government uh, because the assumption is the market will take care of everything. But the market, as we know, caters generally more towards those with capital, particularly if you have a lot of labor and a limited amount of capital, then there'll be a downward pressure on wages eventually. And throw in automation, throw in uh, new smart manufacturing, throw in AI, and then you have a real problem. You have real anxiety and insecurity. I mean, look at what Google and Facebook have done to journalism. In 1998, as per the Pew Research Report, there were 1.9 jobs in public relations for every job in journalism. 2018, that figure is 6.4 is to 1. Because advertising, 77% of it goes to Google and Facebook, the rest to Amazon and others perhaps. And subscription, well, no one really wants to pay because we live in the age of free content. Um, that's what the internet enabled. Music is free, all creative work is free. So there have been winners and losers. And if I'm speaking to journalists tonight, we are certainly amongst the losers of the last 20 years. <laughs> so uh, so the, the dominant, the dominant uh, elites, whether government or private, started uh, looking out for their own interest. And the current institutions failed to take care of public good. And the Romans always said that you know a system is, going to, is in decline if there is private splendor and public squalor. And you just have to take a walk around San Francisco, walk out of the Twitter office, walk around a few blocks, see the homeless people and the, and the needles, and you know that that Roman adage certainly holds true, most certainly in San Francisco, but in large parts of America and, and places like Kenya, India, South Africa, Brazil, and I could go on. Okay, what is the second point we were going to talk about? Anyone remembers? Or I have lost you. Have I lost you? I was saying that the, the, the fabric, right? I was talking about the fabric that knits us together. The social fabric, the cultural fabric, the economic fabric, that is in tatters. What do I mean by that? Um, a very simple thing. Um, in, in the 1950s, 
if you were a boy from Illinois, um, or a young man from Illinois, you probably had been through World War II, you had met someone from Mississippi, uh, you had gone through the GI Bill, you had a clear sense of, of being American. You knew which town you came from, there was a culture you belonged to, a social uh, community around you. Economically, um, things were more certain. Um, you go back to the UK in the 1950s, yes, things were boring and decolonization had begun and uh, uh, the NHS had begun. Uh, the NHS actually began uh, 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 right after World War II, thanks to the Clement Attlee government uh, and, and the era of Butskillism, which is, uh, you know, who Ga Hugh Gateskill and, and Rab Butler, a Labour Chancellor and a Conservative Chancellor of Exchequer, which is really Treasury Secretary, the equivalent of Treasury Secretary or Finance Minister in countries. They had similar, similar policies. That's why the term um, uh, uh, yeah, butskillism emerged. And, and the point is there was an economic consensus as to, okay, we will run the economy which will um, have investment in healthcare, infrastructure, or whatever. There was a certain agreement and, and that uh, um, economic consensus held across different parties. It wasn't as if one person was saying that uh, uh, we need to, to leave the EU and the other person was saying, no, no, we should stay in the EU and the third person was saying that uh, uh, we don't know yet, let's have another referendum. You look at the UK today uh, and uh, who knows, the Scots may leave, Northern Ireland may blow up. And the social, again, and the social fabric um, and the cultural fabric um, and, and the economic fabric of most countries is stretched, um, partly because people are self-selecting themselves according to socioeconomic grounds. Um, there are also racial biases there, in, particularly in Latin America and the US. Uh, the favelas tend to be the way they are, and of course the posh neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro are all largely descendants of conquistadores, Portuguese conquistadores, of course. Uh, and, and so the, there is this, and it's not that such stratification has never existed, but that has exacerbated over the last few years, socially, culturally, uh, economically, and that is what uh, Donald Trump taps into. He eats burgers and fries. He doesn't eat a regular salad, unlike the Obamas, who are elitist. You know, uh, he's not having cheese and wine uh, like all of you. <laughs> so even in terms of cuisine, there is this widening. Um, and, um, and, and that uh, means that if there is less in common, democracy means you have to be able. It's rule of the people, really. You have to be able to sit together and agree to disagree. Well, if all of you were to vote that I should be thrown headfirst into the street. It was a unanimous vote. That would be a democracy, sort of. That wouldn't really be a modern democracy. Because we, we, inbuilt in democracy, modern democracy is this idea of minority rights, meaning, okay, you know, views can change and you have elections and then there is this idea of an independent judiciary, uh, which as we know, uh, is not very independent these days. <laughs> Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so with democracy, unless you have a shared warp and woof, social, cultural, and, and, and economic, things start tearing apart because then it becomes a game of interest groups. If you can get together, cobble together, the Latin vote and the Indian Americans and the, and, and, and the Jewish Americans and uh, and you give everyone a share of the pie, you do, in a good poke barrel politics, you can write to power. Sure, but now you have this disintegration wherein everyone is competing for a share of the pie. And, and that leads to more and more quid pro quo, more and more populism, and that eventually puts a strain on democracy itself because it becomes dysfunctional and people say, hang on a moment, we need a Caesar to solve this. 
But remember, if you want to understand populism and, and the decline of democracy, really the best book is still The Republic by Plato. Socrates was killed after due process. Democratically, he got time to defend himself. And everyone voted, yeah, Socrates should die. And he drank hemlock. And, and it, is, it is important to remember that Greek democracy collapsed thereafter. So did Roman democracy once Caesar appeared because it was dysfunctional by then. And that is what we are facing. The third thing, which I said, the Brownian motion, the mind in Brownian motion point, meaning that we've had so many changes in the environment, so many assaults on our senses, that we've lost the plot. We've lost a sense of identity and who we are. And I say that uh, with little knowledge. I rely a lot on my friends who are neuroscientists, and so it's secondhand knowledge. So I apologize to everyone if I come across as ignorant. And I am on this point. But I'm operating on intuition, which should count for something. Um, and, and I will say one thing. My phone is switched off. But I can assure you, when my phone is switched on, if I'm not disciplined, I lose the ability to think deeply and coherently about a complex issue. If I have too many messages, and I have no WhatsApp, Sorry, I have WhatsApp, but I have no Twitter, no Facebook, and no other social media on my phone. And, and even then, sometimes the emails, the texts, the WhatsApp messages get too much. I have cousins, younger cousins. I've had students, I've been visiting faculty at Berkeley and IIT. I have seen lots of people when I am on tubes. I have spoken to, to older friends as well some of whom are grandparents. And they all say that somehow the coming of this has meant that their reading has declined, has meant that they get too much dubious uh, videos and links. Um, and uh, they wonder whether it is true. Well, algorithms, remember, all of these are run by for-profit maximizing companies. How do they get profit? Well. A, they have to get uh, you on their platform, what Mark Zuckerberg calls network effects. And once they have you on the platform, you ha they have to have you on for longer and longer. Why? Because the longer you are on these platforms, the more ads they can sell you, the more they can micro-target the ads. We want to sell to brown, bald men um, miraculous hair-growing lotions who live in New York. Atul Singh, targeting, bombarding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that kind of micro -tar. you too, too. You, you, <laughs> you won't escape that either. No, no, no. I, I, you know, I, I take pole position there because I have even less hair than you. Uh, but, but the point I'm making is that your senses are assaulted by stimuli incessantly giving you dopamine hits. We know from studies that attention spans have shortened. We know Professor Jean Twenge's study that tells us that teens are having a mental health crisis and suicide rates have skyrocketed. We know from all the chatter about echo chamber effects because algorithms, because they are playing the attention economy, feed you exactly what you want. And you get news from exactly people who are friends, your friends, so you have filter bubbles and echo chambers. And everyone is living in an alternate, alternative reality. And everyone is living away from their physical self, which we didn't evolve for. We did not evolve to look at a flat screen. My friend William Softke writes uh, tech turncore truths. And he has a fantastic article on why screens are bad for you. For instance, the range of color on a screen is a fraction of what you see in real life. The flatness of the screen destroys your eyes in the long run. So read William Sofke. I'm not an expert on it. Read others. So we do know that these things are causing havoc with us just the way opium did, and we didn't know. And remember, the British East India Company used to grow opium in India and sell it to China. And the principle was freedom of trade, free markets. 
Just as communism is dangerous, so are free markets. As I said, we can't view the world through binary systems. And what is happening with this huge, constant bombardment, and along with that, add to what's happening in the poorer part of the world, Africa, where I've just come back from. I was in Dakar, and a gentleman, an older gentleman, who did his dissertation on Indian literature, uh, uh, one of the most learned, insightful, warm, kind, and wonderful people I've met, said, uh, and he did his dissertation on Mulk Raj Anand, and he said something very interesting. He said, in Africa, we never had the kind of misery and poverty and strat social stratification and urban slums and traffic jams as you have in India. And he said, but we are getting there. What is happening all across Africa? Massive urbanization. Go to Nairobi, one of the most soulless places on the planet, just like Delhi or Mumbai. Uh, there are many examples. Uh, we could pick up Rio, right? We could pick up Johannesburg. Um, and what is happening? You get all these people who move away from small, tight-knit rural communities. Suddenly, they are in urban areas. Urban area. They don't know who they are. They are addicted to the cell phone. They are getting all kinds of information, most of which is exaggerated, if not false. Some of it certainly is false. Fake news. Fake news. And and they're looking for a sense of belonging. They're, they are lost. And there is this massive insecurity they have, particularly if, if you know, they come from a male-oriented rural society where they could work and earn a living or a working class society and suddenly they are unemployed. So that leads to addiction. That leads to the opioid crisis or, 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 or alcoholism or just rampant crime, which South Africa is infamous for, and so is Kenya, and, and so increasingly is, is India. And, and, and it's one of those things that it, it is at the same time seemingly very complex, but, but at the heart of it is a simple issue. It is the combination of breakdown of community, urbanization, and bombardment of technology. And I think, and I don't want to leave people here depressed, I think, that if, we, if we've got to solve this, we've got to, we've got to fight to create um, institutions that work. We have to hold our elites accountable, um, particularly have in them a sense of noblesse oblige. Um, we have to make sure that the social, cultural, and economic fabric works, uh, or sort of is knit up again. And we've got to somehow figure out a sense of meaning and, and community and living harmoniously. Again, questions. Thank you for your time. Yes, please, here. I'll pass the mic along because he's recording. I thought, thank you for your very uh, observant and obviously, it's not on, but an obviously holistic view. Uh, you brought us to a date of 1991. I mean, that was approximately the time that the U.S. started to lose its soul because it decided, the corporations decided, mm -hmm. in order to benefit because the stock market only applauded companies that every quarter would show an incremental increase. Mm -hmm. So how do they get that? They get that by reducing their, uh, their, uh, their workforce and by selling their technology. And so, I mean, if you want to look at an economic um, moment mm -hmm. that precipitated, mm -hmm. and then what followed, as you said so brilliantly, I think was the political decline, and then we come to today where we are so divided, we actually don't have, you know, if you had a backdrop, you have some way to measure mm -hmm. how far you've come or how close you are, but without that, our society is at a loss. And without having the standards, you look at the communication, which you're referring to, and there is no right and wrong. We've seen mm -hmm. the dissemination of information without any kind of viable uh, assessment mm -hmm. of what is true and what's not true. So that's all pretty depressing. <laughs> what would you suggest are moves that we could make that would maybe recalibrate uh, 
countries, uh, nations, for their own internal strength or aggregate them for you know, a greater for a, a greater strength within the region? Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. And I think I would uh, take a leaf out of um, a British politician who's now left the Tory party and become independent, a chap uh, whom I respect, who's quite intellectual, called Rory Stewart. Now, Rory and I don't know each other, and uh, hopefully we will. We have uh, one mutual friend, at least, um, and he's an interesting character. But um, I want to give credit where it's due. I think the future um, is local. To think that miraculously, after such a breakdown, we can all come together is we are living in La La Land. Uh, I think if everyone here in the room was to go and find a group of five people, not more, just five people, and, and organize or, or, or meet regularly, to begin with just meet regularly, around, around two or three things they really care about. Some could care about the environment, someone else could care about inequality, um, someone else could care about health, which is a big crisis both um, in India and Kenya and Brazil, as well as, uh, as, well as the US and, and, and uh, uh, the more affluent world, and say, look, um, these are the issues we, we want to work on. And, and from that kernel of five, from that uh, very bottom up, then expand and grow the groups once there is a coherence to discourse. Uh, I think that is the way forward. That's what we are trying to do with Fair Observer. I mean, unlike um, uh, Twitter, uh, there is an editorial process. Poor Thanos has to suffer it. So many of our, of our contributors have to suffer it. I have to suffer it. I can tell you I'm terrified of Anna, you know, my, my, my deputy managing editor. I, I, I dread to, to, to think she would edit my article, you know. And, 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 and my managing editor, Abul Hassanat, tells me, you know, in the morning when I have been working till 2.30, get up uh, and review your article or I'll publish. So I'm terrified of him too, though less than Anna. So, so the point is, uh, uh, moving aside the facetious element, is that what we are trying to do is create that community in the world news space, combining uh, local expertise and global discourse. And we began small. And I think in each of the fields, we have to begin small and then re-knit things together. And who knows? The shape of countries has always changed. It may change again. Countries come and go. Borders come and go. But what is more fundamental than that is human beings engage with each other, communicate with each other. They can trade with each other. At the same time, they don't just trade with each other. They also recognize that to trade, and people forget that Adam Smith was a moral philosopher, everyone needs to have some ethical standards. If you were to go and buy, let's say, 500 grams of onions from the lady sitting next to you, and the lady had a 500 gram uh, you know, uh, weigh scales, but it really, she gave you 400 grams. And, and, and then if she went and bought something from the other lady next to her, and, and the other lady said, I'm selling you a, a gold necklace, but really sold her something that was gold-plated, eventually, all trust in the market would collapse. So even for a market to exist, forget the government. You need a certain sense of values. So we've got to rediscover some sort of commonality of human values and decency and honesty and all that jazz. Um, yes? I sort of feel like for those of us who did not grow up with the yeah. landscape, we know what life was before. Yeah. Obviously, there's been a lot of change over the years. Oh, so they are certainly not. Do the cocaine dealers ever sell cocaine to their children? Exactly, exactly. So how, for those of us who are stuck with uh, the kids who looked it up at Silicon Valley here, like how do we, how do we those, help young people like, follow that example of those kids, like put the cat back in the bag? So I think the first thing is that all of us somehow have to figure out how to tame this. This is a Frankenstein or this is a, uh, as you said, the cat's out of the bag or the genie's out of the bottle. We've got to put it back in. We've got to put this down, and this is a good tool, but the tool should not control us. 
This is a tool to communicate with people. If we communicate with the tool and forget the people, we, we are done. So I think it's important that we spend more time offline. We set the example. We get, we get kids involved in the physical world. Because at the end of the day, we did evolve to run around and play. And if they can get their dopamine hits through that, and it's tough because it's always easy to eat five ice creams and eat two burgers and get fat and lazy. Uh, to, to, to keep your weight down, um, I mean, at least for me, I have to put in a lot of effort. I, you know, I walk everywhere, I, I try not to eat too much, even though I like the finer things in life. Uh, but it is always a struggle. And I think we've got to impose that struggle at an individual level and set examples and, and then you know, create environments because environments are important and, and cultures are important, where in, what people do collectively. And I think what the French have done is very interesting. They've banned cell phones in schools. And so things like that might be a good start. But it's going to be hard. There are no easy answers. It's going to be inch by inch, foot by foot. Remember, I mean, it took a long time to tackle the evils of 19th century colonization or even imperialism. The, so what we are seeing is human psyche, greed, you know, surfacing again, you know, the cultural tone was set by that speech, greed is good. And I think we've got to somehow say, yeah, maybe it's not so good. Uh, I, I've been, I'm being told to shut up, but I'll take one final question oh, oh, and then call it a day. Sorry. Or call it a night. Uh, you, you touched upon the elitism. Yeah. It seems to prevail. Mm -hmm. Not in this election. Okay, so the elitism will continue or? The elitism is bound to continue and uh, the biggest perpetrators of it are places like Harvard and Yale uh, and, and uh, American Ivy Leagues because what has happened is they've created an education industry which, uh, which um, benefits all those who are economically privileged as the scandal showed, this entire admission scandal showed. And, and I think uh, we are struggling with the same uh, uh, syndrome that has always afflicted um, humanity since time immemorial. Uh, Mahabharat, who's read the Mahabharat? Okay, all right. There's a character called Dhritarash. Mahabharat is the equivalent of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. Uh, it's a great epic. I, uh, you know, I, I strongly recommend you read Fair Observer, but you also read the Mahabharat. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and do sign up for our free newsletter. Uh, don't forget that. Um, now, the important thing is that there is a character called Dhritarashtra who's blind, and actually he's also metaphorically blind because he loves his son so much that he's going to prefer him over others and anything right or wrong. Uh, he was blind or he was acting as a No, no, he was blind and his wife acted as blind. Uh, so now the interesting thing is that all of us love our children those of us who have them, right? And, and we want the best for them. And what happens is that in the love for your children, you forget to love other children. And so you say, fairness be damned, I, I've got to push my kid into Harvard, into this. So I send that kid into the best private school, have five tutors, have admissions consultants. And this whole racket that American education has become, especially liberal arts education, and it is nothing but an extortionate racket wherein they have huge endowments, uh, they've become these corrupt equivalent of 16th century Catholic monasteries, living on the loot and sell, selling indulgences, and, 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 and costing an arm and a leg. And so first you have to pay a lot to get in, and then once you get in, it's like a country club, and then everything, uh, this incestuous elite will, will rule the world. And this calls for an institutional change, a cultural change, a whole scale reform. And that, I think, will come when people react and say, we need fairness again. This country became a republic because of an idea of meritocracy. It kicked out George III as king and said, we'll have George Washington instead. And that fundamental ideal of the best man for the best job has to return and inherited privilege will have to be a challenged and attacked again. And right now, that's not possible because elections cost too much. Everyone will have to raise money. And if you're taking a lot of money from a lot of people, 
particularly powerful people. You'll have to then, once you're in office, you'll have to be very circumspect. And then elections are a two-year circus. So, so I think unless the culture changes, unless people say, we need reform and substantive institutional reform, it's not just about voting the most popular boy or girl. We won't have change. How is this viewed in Berkeley? Uh, Berkeley is a shadow of what it was. Berkeley is as institutionalized as anyone, anyone else. It's playing the same game. So there are no exceptions now left. Maybe there are. I'm sorry. Maybe there are, but very few. On that note, I've been told to, to, to stop it for the evening. Thank you very much. And have a, uh, have a, have a great Christmas and holidays and uh, Happy New Year. Thank you.